Infill is an integral part to your 3D printed models, so why not master it? Today we'll cover basics right up to the experimental. I have spent some time experimenting with Infill and I'm excited to share my results. This video started in response to the many commenters asking about a patterned PEO sheet I've been using with some of my printers. It leaves the same pattern on the bottom layer of the print, so I wondered, could I replicate that with a plain bed and what else could I achieve with experimentation? We'll get to that later, because for now, we're gonna start with some basics. We're going to start from the very beginning by answering the question, what is infill? The easiest way to answer this is to look at the G-code preview for a sliced model. The most common one that you would know would be the sparse infill on the inside, seen here as a mesh pattern in red. When we slice, one parameter that most people will be familiar with is the density of the sparse infill. And if we up that to 50%, reslicing shows that the pattern is a lot more dense. That should ensure more strength, but it also will mean additional printing time and additional filament used. Conversely, if we lower the infill density right down to 1%, we can see that there's almost nothing there with a drastic reduction in model printing time as well as filament usage. The next type of infill we have is on the top and bottom of the model and we call this solid infill. We can think of solid infill as having the equivalent density of 100%. If we hide all of the other components, we can see that we have this solid infill on any top facing surfaces as well as any bottom facing surfaces. And sandwiched inside that, we can see that we also have internal solid infill but this is a poor example, so let's slice something else. Instead, let's load in this low poly fox. If we look inside, we can see that we have much more of this internal solid infill, shown here with a purple color. Hiding the outer walls will show that it's used in numerous places to fill in any little gaps and to provide a better base for other forms of extrusion to go on top. Now that we have a baseline, let's start exploring how we can adjust parameters to suit various scenarios. Before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping and future proofing. One thing to note is that in this video, I'm using Orca Slicer, a derivative of Bamboo Studio and Prusa Slicer. While the positions of these parameters may change, if you poke around or search, you should be able to find the same settings in Prusa Slicer and Super Slicer. There's many settings that I can't cover in the scope of this video, so instead I'm linking to some great resources online, such as this Prusa Slicer page about infill with examples of each, as well as their pros and cons. I'm also linking an equivalent page for Bamboo Studio that applies to Orca Slicer as well. And this was harder to find, but Cura also has a page going through some of the different infills with illustrated examples. Okay, our first scenario deals with when we're trying to save filament. And generally when we save filament, we save time as well. Let's take this simple cylinder and say that it's only cosmetic, as in it doesn't need to be strong at all when it's finished. Slicing it without changing any settings for me uses just over 45 grams of filament and a print duration of 1 hour and 12 minutes. And we can see inside that the sparse infill is anything but. One of the first things that we can do is lower the amount of solid infill on the top and bottom surfaces. But this only saves a gram and a half of filament and only 2 minutes of printing time. So what about if we lower the sparse infill density? That's taken off almost 10 grams and 10 minutes as well. Let's lower it even further to a very minimal 2%. We can see that we're now using about half of the original filament and we've taken off almost half an hour. But there is a problem with this setup and that's that we can see the internal infill through the top of the model. And not only that, the surfaces where it's not underneath are quite rough. And that's because as the extruder lays down the solid extrusion for the top, it's going to drape between these, meaning the top surface is not quite flat and loses some quality. Now of course we can up the infill density, but that will also up the filament and time. But fortunately, there's a sparse infill pattern that's designed for this scenario, and that is lightning infill. When we slice and at the base of the model, it looks like there's pretty much nothing there. But as we go up through the layers, the lightning will grow until it's supporting most of the underside of the top layer. Even after turning the density up, we save around 12 minutes from our printing time, but our filament usage is nearly halved. So the next time you have a cosmetic model, why not try lightning infill? For models where we do need some strength but we still want to save filament, there's a backup option, and that is support cubic. Once again previewing from the bottom, we can see that the triangles are more spaced out, but as we rise up towards the top surface, 
the density increases and the top surface will be nicely supported. Not much of a time saving here, but again a substantial reduction in filament and a fairly strong part as well. Beyond what we've just seen, here's a universal way to save print time for pretty much any model. The first thing to note is that some sparse infill patterns will be faster than others. Typically those with straight lines like rectilinear, grid and line will be faster than something like honeycomb. And we can see that with the honeycomb pattern and the same 15% density, our print time has ballooned to almost two and a half hours. One great setting in every slicer in Orca Slicer is called infill combination. And when we tick it and slice, we can see we've saved almost 15 minutes without changing any other settings. If we change the preview to layer height, it becomes obvious what's going on. The outside perimeters are sliced with a typical 0.2 millimeter layer height, but the layer height of the sparse infill within is twice as thick at 0.4. So as the model is printing, every second layer, the infill will be laid down, but twice as thick. This is a guaranteed way to save print time. But just keep in mind that these larger extrusions will require a lot more hot end flow. So if your hot end flow is already marginal, this might push it over the edge. In Prusa Slicer, we activate this setting by changing combine infill every from one layer to two or more. However, this will be limited by the nozzle width. In Super Slicer, we have to untick supporting dense layer, and then we can up this value from one to something higher. Simplify 3D has it in the infill tab, and it's called combined infill layers, and in Cura, the setting is called infill layer thickness. And we can achieve the same results by multiplying it by the layer height. In this example, 0.2 to 0.4. Now let's look at a part where we want it to be strong, but we don't want to be wasteful with our filament use. Our example object is this spur gear. And the first thing we want to do anytime we want maximum strength is to increase the perimeters or wall loops. Apart from that, I'm slicing with default settings and we can see that the infill is a little bit hit and miss in reinforcing each of these gear tips. Obviously one strategy here is to simply up the sparse infill density, which will fill up these areas much more uniformly. Now we've got what we want around the delicate areas, but it's also quite dense through the middle. To combat this, we can change from grid to a pattern called adaptive cubic. But as you can see, all of the triangles are quite uniform and it took me a little while to work out why it wasn't working as the documentation said. The manual clearly shows that towards the edges, we should have smaller, denser infill and much sparser towards the middle, saving some filament. So why aren't we seeing that? Well, let's visualize what's going on. Cubic infill in any form is made out of a pattern of these three dimensional cubes tilted up on their tip. And because this spur gear is so thin, there's only so big a cube that you can fit vertically within the space. So a larger cube that uses less filament won't be placed by the slicer because it simply doesn't fit. So to experiment, let's scale this not uniformly, but instead making Z much taller. And when we look inside the slice model, we can see at the bottom that it's dense and then the cubes get larger as we head towards the middle and then once again shrink as we head towards the top. By making the model larger, we can fit in larger and less dense cubes, saving a lot of filament, but not giving up much strength. One thing to note is that you'll need a fairly high value for your infill density. Think of it as setting how dense you want these smaller sections to be, and then the slicer will automatically make the inner sections less dense. So comparing regular cubic infill with 50% density, we use just over 350 grams of filament, and it takes just over 11 hours to print. And by switching to adaptive, we should still have pretty much all of the strength we need in the delicate areas, but we use more than 150 grams less filament and save around an hour and a half of print time. Definitely a great option as long as the model is large enough to take advantage of the structure. Everything so far has been quite sensible and practical, so I think it might be time to get progressively more experimental. Let's start with improving the appearance of our models without doing any CAD work. Let's say we've got a simple shape and we want to make it look nicer with very little effort. One thing you might consider is completely turning off the top and bottom solid infill. To go with this, I'd recommend upping your wall thickness slightly and then hitting slice to see how it looks. Now the default infill pattern doesn't look particularly good, but we can change it to something more interesting like honeycomb and then come into quality and set the sparse infill width to twice as wide. Now when we slice, we get a much more interesting object although I'm still unhappy with how some of these segments don't seem to be quite complete. So all I'm going to do is up the density to make the pattern fit a little better. And already we have a much more interesting looking part and the printed result looks just as good. You probably wouldn't want to do this with a structural part, 
as it's definitely weaker without the top and bottom solid layers to tie everything together. Let's try and recreate a patterned top and bottom surface, similar to what we saw on that aftermarket plate. The first thing to note is that we have more options than the default straight lines for our solid infill. Some of these are quite interesting, such as octogram spiral, concentric infill, which will follow the perimeter shape inwards, and probably my favorite, the Hilbert curve. For any of these to make them more prominent, we want to come to quality, and for the first layer, as well as the top surface, double our extrusion width on a 0.4 nozzle, 0.8 is just about spot on. This will increase the size of the extrusions, making the pattern more prominent. Here's the printed versions, and I'm sure you'll agree they look a lot more interesting than what we normally see, particularly the Hilbert curve. There is a problem here, however, and that's that the bottom side of the model is typically squished and a lot of detail from the different patterns is lost. If your bed surface is grippy enough, you can overcome this by temporarily tweaking the Z offset to increase the distance between the nozzle and the bed. Here's a before and after with the increased distance on the right, and I think this semi-squished pattern is the best appearance yet. As interesting as this is, we're not limited to only the top and bottom infill patterns. With some lateral thinking, we can also access all of the patterns found for sparse infill. To do this, we need to right click and then add a modifier, with a simple cylinder being sufficient. With this generic cylinder selected on the left, we're now going to come and resize it. Make sure uniform scale is not ticked, setting the height to one layer thick, 0.2 millimeters in my case, and making the exterior dimensions at least as big as our actual object. We then need to move it into position so it just overlaps the bottom layer. We can then select it, make a copy. Here I did Control C, then Control V on the keyboard, and move that copy up so it just overlaps the top layer. Now for these modifiers, we're going to click on them and come to Strength. We're going to turn off the bottom and top solid layers, and then change the sparse infill pattern to something like Honeycomb. You'll need to repeat these steps for the second modifier disc. Now when we slice the model, we have quite a different effect, because the model is being sliced as three different objects. We'll get a one layer thick hexagon pattern, with solid infill, underneath and on top, meaning that we should still have pretty good structural integrity. We'll notice the bottom is a little bit thicker than what we see on the top. So all we need to do is adjust the sparse infill to that thicker diameter, we might also need to play with the sparse infill density to get the upper and lower surfaces to match too. Again, a distinctive appearance and something you normally wouldn't see on a 3D print. But don't worry, we can get even closer to this and we can get this pattern on the top as well. In CAD, I've drawn and extruded a simple triangle and then used a pattern to extend it and each of these has a tiny gap in between. The whole array is then exported as a single SDL. I've scaled my disk larger, and now I'm going to right click on it, once again add a modifier, but this time come to load, and then select the STL from my hard drive. It's going to be really tall, and you can scale it, making sure that it overlaps the entire object, and that it extends above and below, so the object is encased inside. Now we click on this modifier and make some simple changes, thickening the top surface, but more importantly, setting the top and bottom infill pattern to concentric. Now once we slice, something interesting happens. The parts of the disc where the triangles didn't intersect maintain their usual monotonic infill, but any portions where the triangles did intersect have this separate pattern. And the way we set this up works for the top and bottom as well. Printed, this one I think looks really cool, and I love the fact that the pattern is on the top as well as the bottom. Pushing the ID further, I created another array with two different size circles, importing that as a modifier, once again resizing it so the original disc was encased, and again set the modifier to have concentric infill, however you can use anything else that you like here. It's really fun to play with these modifiers, changing the thicknesses and patterns for the two different parts. I don't think the printed result looks as good as the last one, but it's still valid as an example of how to experiment with these patterns. Normally we don't see the sparse infill, but what if we experiment by exposing it? To achieve this, all we need to do is turn off all of our wall loops as well as all of our bottom and top solid layers. And now when we slice, we should be left with only the infill. Grid's a little bit boring for this, so instead I went for gyroid. Gyroid is an interesting pattern that looks absolutely mesmerizing as it's built. But you might notice that we have all of these anchor sections on the outside that are ruining the aesthetic. To get rid of those, we come down to sparse infill anchor length, set it to zero, and maximum length for the infill anchor can be set to zero as well. Now when we slice, we're left with pure infill pattern, 
and of course, I just had to try printing this. The end result is pretty interesting to look at. We can see that it is in fact hollow, kind of like a sponge, and the outer surface isn't that clean because there's no walls to anchor everything. It's also surprisingly strong, which prompted me to repeat by scaling everything up and printing in TPU. The outer surface is messy, but there is one amazing property, and that's that this whole thing acts like a spring. Changing the density will allow you to tune how deformable this is, as will changing the infill pattern, this version being cubic. The appearance is a lot more clean, despite the fact I forgot to turn off the outside anchors, and it's a lot more rigid when you're trying to compress it, but it still has excellent memory, always returning back to its original form. Wanting to push this concept further, I drew a simple sketch, then a helix, and used it to sweep this spiral path to export as an STL modifier once more. Let's return to our low poly fox, and once again right click, add a modifier and load that spiral STL. Exactly where you place it and rotate it to interact with the model is paramount, and it's worth some experimentation. And once you're happy with it, we can click on it and modify the properties. As you can see for this spiral, I've turned off all the external walls, and set a fairly dense trihexagon sparse infill pattern with no anchors. If we slice, we're already most of the way there, but we have some unwanted internal solid infill like we discovered earlier. To remove this, we need to change the minimum sparse infill threshold to a really small number, and that should have the effect of cleaning everything up. Anywhere where our spiral modifier touched the model, we have no exterior walls and we can see the infill. But for everywhere else, it's printed just like a normal object. Just a reminder that you're going to need quite a grippy bed, so those sparse infill patterns don't become dislodged. Apart from that, this prints just like any other print. The final result I would describe as unique. Some people might call it artistic, some people might think it's an abomination. But the point is, it's just another way that we can employ infill to change the appearance and structure of our model. Hopefully there's something here for novices and veterans alike. Let me know your favourite in the comments section, or add to the knowledge pool with your best tip. I would suggest having a browse through the docs for your slicer of choice. There's probably some great features you might not know about. Oh, and if you want to replicate these patterns at home, I've uploaded the files to printables. That's all from me. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy mastering your 3D printed infill. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe, and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.